So welcome everyone to this first uh, Development Studies uh, seminar in our seminar series. My name is Faisi um, and I uh, coordinate the seminar series together with a number of brilliant colleagues who you will see uh, milling around, helping, and, and, um, and also a number of uh, volunteers who um, dedicate a great deal of time um, uh, uh, that they put into the series for everything from tweeting to organizing the reception afterwards to uh, publicizing um, the series. Um, um, so thank you uh, all for coming. So we have a, a, a brilliant panel uh, today um, with Andrea Cornwall, Tanya Kaiser and Mira Sabaratnam. Um, on deconstructing development discourse, buzzwords and fuzzwords revisited. And this is based on Andrea's um, book of 2010, which uh, she's updating, um, and she'll tell us um, all about it. So I will just introduce um, each of our speakers, um, and they'll have about 15 to 20 minutes, um, and then we'll open it out to the floor. And uh, in particular, we really do want to get your uh, thoughts and your ideas on um, on on the topic on buzzwords and fuzzwords. Um, okay, so Andrea is a political anthropologist who specialises in anthro in the anthropology of democracy, citizen participation, participatory research, gender and sexuality. She's worked on topics ranging from understanding women's perspectives on family planning, fertility, and sexually transmitted infection in Nigeria and Zimbabwe. Uh, public engagement in UK regeneration programs, the quality of democracy deliberate, of democratic de deliberation in new democratic spaces in Brazil, the use, the use and abuse of participatory appraisal in Kenya, domestic workers' rights activism in Brazil, and sex workers' rights, rights activism in India. Wow, a range of things. Um, Tanya Kaiser is Senior Lecturer in Forced Migration Studies here in the department. She has degrees in Literature and Anthropology from the Universities of Bristol, Bristol and Oxford, and her research focuses on forced migration in Africa, East and West Africa in particular, culture and society, and internal conflict in Uganda, and conflict in South Sudan. And she's also been the program convener um, for the BA in Development Studies, so she has a lot to say um, on this subject. Mira Samaratnam is Senior Lecturer in International Relations um, in Politics uh, here at SOAS. Her research interests are in the colonial and post-colonial dimensions of international relations in both theory and practice, and she's worked on questions of decolonization, Eurocentrism, race and methodology in IR, and she's applied these concepts um, to the analysis of international development aid, peace building, state and state building, most recently in her book, Decolonizing uh, Intervention. And that book can also be downloaded for free, um, which I think we'll tweet at some point. Um, and her regional interests are in Southern Africa and the Indian Ocean region. And she's currently working on questions of race and IR theory and a post-colonial historiography of the First World War. Um, so if you are tweeting, the hashtags are SOASDevStudies, all one word, and ESRC. Um, and I think that's all. Uh, so, Andrea. Thank you. So to start with, um, a quote from um, one of the most amazing wordsmiths, Goethe. When ideas, when ideas fail, words come in very handy. So my interest in, um, in language, in development language um, as it came to be, but also in the politics of language, the anthropology of language, was peaked when I was a student here at SOAS, um, and I studied with Mark Hobart in my third year um, of my anthropology degree. So how many of you are studying anthropology? And how many of you are in your third year? Okay, so a couple of you might be doing a version of that very course, which introduced me to some really, really interesting linguistic anthropology that got me thinking about how words have their own lives and they travel through different times and spaces and people use them and mean them in different kinds of ways and use them for different political purposes and the political nature of speech but also the bureaucratic and ordinary nature of speech and the ways in which we can hear a word but actually have such different meanings that we associate with it that we're having parallel conversations and don't really understand each other or we think we understand each other but actually we are meaning very different things. And something that intrigued me about the use of certain kinds of language was that certain words can mask intentions and can mask um, projects, political projects and possibilities. So they can be used as code words to be able to do things with. Um, so I found myself working many years after leaving SOAS um, in development um, in a place called the Institute of Development Studies um, with gender, participation, accountability um, and human rights and empowerment. So these are all nice words 
feel-good words, words that I had very fond notions about, but I'd go out into the world and work with people who'd got either different projects that they were harbouring these words under these words, or we were negotiating worlds that were very different, different understandings, political understandings of what development was um, and of what these words could mean and what they would translate into in terms of, of projects in the world. Um, so I became very interested in how people were using those words. And I was invited when um, UNRIST had their um, an anniversary conference to write a piece about those words, um, which took that kind of analysis of what had happened to those words, so the histories and movements and trajectories of those words. Um, and then I, at that conference, bumped into um, Deborah Ead, who was the editor of Development in Practice. Um, and we spent quite a bit of time laughing and joking about buzzword bingo and how some of these words were used as meaningless, empty vehicles um, and were just traded in different places. So we put together a list of people um, who we thought would be really interesting to ask from very different locations to write a piece on a word. So we come across something, for example, I was just saying the example earlier, I came across somebody who had written something about country ownership, who was the, in charge of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, so the European, um, the European World Bank, who talks about country ownership, which is a very um, fond buzzword in the 90s, about ownership of that country by the people who were determining its economic policies. So we thought, this is great, let's ask this guy to write something. Um, they were activists who we thought would be really interesting to write something about advocacy. What does that mean? How's it been used? How's it been abused? Sustainability. Um, I'll go through some of the examples. Gender. Gender is a very classic one. Peace building. Best practice, which was a, a big one in that, in that time. Harmonization, um, which is the donors coordinating with each other. Civil society, um, NGOs, sustainability, corruption, good governance, uh, fragile states. And there's something about looking through this list of words and thinking it conjures up a particular moment as well um, in development. The, the popularity of those words 10 years ago defined a development agenda which is profoundly different to the agenda that we now see in development. In fact, that we see in many of the nation states um, with the rise of populism and really big political transformations. Some of these words could no longer be mobilised in quite the same way. They have had to be sheltered in other places. They've lost their meaning. I worked on empowerment for 10 years, and empowerment became something over that period that was completely swept up with corporations and their own uses being made of girls' and women's empowerment and came to mean something totally different to the term that, as it meant to the people who claimed it for feminist activism. So it's interesting to look back, um, and so something that I thought would be interesting to bring today. So this idea of people in different locations using these words in different ways, um, and how from 10 years ago to now, um, what's changed. So put out a call on Twitter for what today's development buzzwords are, um, and started thinking with a request to update this book, what would be the buzzwords of now, and what are the buzzwords that have gone out? So I'm just going to go through this list and just share with you some of the buzzwords of today that came out from that quite wide to Twitter um, conversation. So first of all, the extent to which the language of business has come in. So a lot of corporate language has crept into development language in a very, very marked way. So if you go to a random buzzword generator from business, you'll hear many of those words being traded in development spaces. Um, we thought, you know, we'd keep social protection and poverty reduction in, but they've both changed in the way in which they're being framed. Globalisation would go out and global would come in. Citizenship would go out and inclusion would come in. Um, social capital would go out and resilience would come in. Human rights, we thought, was almost on its way out in terms of the ways in which it was used in development. And words like intersectionality were on their way in in terms of being used in a really quite a vacuous way. Um, advocacy out, innovation in, NGOs out, impact in, harmonisation out, alignment in. Um, and then words like voice, open government, open government, securitisation, um, and so on, co-create, um, cross-cutting. <laughs> so it's quite an interesting exercise, and I'm, gonna, I'm looking forward to hearing what the other panellists are going to say. Just being aware of and noticing the words that are appearing 
both in the practitioner spaces and also in the policy spaces, and the extent to which these ripple out then into academic spaces, and the extent to which critical academic interrogation, the deconstruction of these words and their meanings and uses, can be used as a way of shining a light back into those spaces and getting people to think and to interrupt um, the kind of habits of mind and habits of thinking that you pick up when you're constantly saturated and surrounded by these words. This has been surprisingly popular. I don't think any of us imagined, either of us who did it, imagined it would still be, 10 years later we'd be asked to do a second edition and it's still being read and used. I think it hit a chord then and I think in some ways that chord is still there for people who are sick of seeing words just being bandied around without any, you know, without any substance to them, but also would rather see, some, you know, still believe that those words are things that could have meaning and want to see them infused with these beliefs about making a better society and making a better world that perhaps they are associated with in their own minds. So this tension between the voiding of meaning and the uses of these words in, in just an ordinary bullshit bingo type of parlance and then the actual real projects that underlie words like human rights, empowerment, voice, justice, um, gender, and so on. So with that, I'll hand over to my the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here Thank you, Susie. and to participate in this, in this panel and the discussion, which I'm sure is going to be very interesting. Um, I am coming at this from a fairly particular angle, I guess, which is to say that when revisiting the book and thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, I was very much thinking about the boundaries between development and humanitarian contexts. And specifically, because of what you already know about the kind of thing that I'm interested in working on and uh, I'm very kind of bound up in, in thinking about the kind of language which is used in discussing the situation and responses to people who are forced to migrate for whatever reason. In many of the cases in which I've carried out research, I've been working with people who've been forced to move by conflict of one kind or another in sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere. But there are, of course, numerous reasons why people move. And although there's nothing new about that, whether you, you know, however, whatever way you look at it, it is nevertheless something that over the last three or four years, in the context of the EU in particular, there has been significantly more discussion about in a whole range of different kinds of contexts than arguably there was for a really, really long time before that. And so I started with the kind of the fairly basic idea of thinking about some of the different ways, some of the different descriptive words which are used to refer to the people who've arrived in the EU over the last three or four years since um, 19, uh, since the 1920s, since 2015. Uh, and, and I'm tripping over my tongue because I'm trying to avoid using the words refugee and migrant, which are the two most common <coughs> words which have been used in various combinations, sometimes with qualifiers, sometimes not. And I don't know whether they would, they don't really count as buzzwords in the sense of the buzzwords which are represented and discussed in this book. But I think that some of the way, thinking about some of the ways in which those terms have been used and the uses to which they've been put is perhaps the kind of the point of overlap. And there are a number of different things which I think we can immediately see emerging if we reflect about the kind of language which has been used to describe people arriving mainly by sea but also across land um, into the EU since 2015, predominantly from conflict affected countries. Um, one is that there is an absolute proliferation of perspectives in the sense that the kinds of actors who are discussing these individuals and groups may be development practitioners, they may be politicians, they may be journalists or other members of the, the media more broadly, they may be ordinary, regular people who don't have any particular professional interest but nevertheless have an interest in this subject in this kind of topic and in this set of movements. They may of course also be the people who are moving themselves, who might indeed have very different sense of what kind of language ought to be being used about the journeys that they're making and the choices that they're making and the opportunities that are open to them within which they can choose from those sets of choices. So there's all of those kinds of things. So first of all we've got a lot of different actors who might be talking about discussing and having various, of course, different reasons to do those things. Um, the people who arrived over a period of time in significantly greater numbers than we had recently seen. 
So the first kind of entry point is to think about, okay, well, what kind of language is most immediately familiar to us when we think about the way in which those movements of people were represented? And I think, you know, the, the biggest kind of arguments which took place in real time, if you like, about the kind of language which should be used was about whether, on, whether one should refer to the movement of people as a refugee crisis or as a migrant crisis. And it sounds superficially like a very kind of trivial um, distinction, but actually it's massively consequential. Um, and I think you know, when we're already thinking about the ways in which different categories of actor in development and contextual contexts might use words quite deliberately and strategically to produce specific sets of outcomes and effect, then it doesn't take us very long to really get to the kind of the crux of what's going on when different terms are selected. Now, even, I mean, you know, we don't have much time, so even to stick to kind of fairly mainstream sources, the BBC, quite a lot of research has been carried out since 2015 on what kind of language and terminology was used in BBC reporting um, of the arrivals of asylum seekers um, into the EU over the period 2015, 2016, and even onwards. And what's come out of a number of different studies produced or commissioned on the one, in one case by UNHCR and carried out by Cardiff um, Journalism School, um, also in, in, in BBC, the BBC's own kind of accounting of its own kind of practice, is that the BBC, which as we know is a public service broadcaster, is supposed to be balanced, kind of objective, and all the rest of it, right from the beginning made the decision to use the word migrant and the words migrant crisis to refer to the arrival of people in very large numbers in conditions of extreme danger and um, in many cases trauma. And it justified its use of the word migrant in terms of the fact that while it stated, and it had a kind of a paragraph that it cut and pasted onto basically every report it published over months and months and months, and it stated its position in terms of an acknowledgement that there were different categories of people represented within these large numbers of people who were arriving and that it was very likely, if not probable, that many of the people who were arriving would make claims for asylum once they reached the EU. And indeed, they didn't want to rule out the possibility that many or even most of them would receive refugee status eventually. But at the moment of their arrival, they set out their position that there was no other accurate way of representing these people collectively without re resorting, in a sense, to this very broad, very kind of difficult to kind of pin down term. In the introduction to her book, Andrea pointed out very clearly it, in 2010 that constellations of words together have kind of multiplier effects in terms of the impact that they can have. And it seems to me that the BBC's choice of word in selecting migrant over refugee, and I'll talk about that in a second, was very, very meaningful in that, for, for lots of reasons, but also in the fact that the word migrant in the popular discourse in the UK and in the political discourse, perhaps more importantly, and to some extent in the development discourse surrounding responses, the humanitarian res discourse surrounding responses to arrivals, is very much about linking the word migrant with a whole load of words and qualifiers which are broadly projected as negative. So it's economic migrant, which even that, perhaps once as a neutral term, no longer feels and looks like a neutral term in terms of the kinds of responses that it provokes or precipitates. Um, the almost ridiculously unmeaningful illegal migrant, which in many ways means absolutely nothing at all, but, and this is the scary part, can be used to mobilise political position and action, even though it's somewhat acknowledged, at least some of the time, by some of the people who are hearing it, that it doesn't really mean anything. And that brings me to kind of another, I think, important point, and this may have kind of wider resonance for some of the other terms as well, which is that there is this extraordinary capacity. I mean, we understand, you know, there is a very substantial and interesting literature on the way in which language encodes meaning. 
you know, one can pursue a whole range of different lines of inquiry about the way in which language and power are associated, the way in which symbolic dimensions of power and authority are encoded in language, in which language can be used in, in a way that's quite coercive, and a whole number of other quite actually interesting and consequential um, areas or domains of inquiry. But when it comes down to it, all of those things being true, what is kind of, in a sense, more pressing is the fact that even where there is, at some level, an acknowledgement or an acceptance that a term is, is being used erroneously, it is deliberately being projected to imply or suggest a linkage between a category which is relatively neutral or technical and a whole range of other negatively inspired meanings and associations, that doesn't stop that term being used in that way. So there is this, what my supervisor 20 years ago used to call functional ignorance going on, where you know that it's not true, and yet you nevertheless have this term kind of circulating. Um, and in a sense, it may not matter in a sense that it's not true, um, that it is not really possible to be an illegal migrant because in practice, um, you know, everyone should know that it is not illegal to enter a country illegally if your intention is to claim asylum when you arrive in it. So that means that nobody is an illegal migrant. They might be a migrant who then claims asylum, which arguably means that they should have been referred to as an asylum seeker all along, i.e. somebody who was going to claim asylum and then did that thing. There is no kind of pretense, really, from the perspective of the person making the journey and making the claim about what it is they're in the process of trying to do. But in the way that it's represented, you see quite a different set of issues. I suspect I'm probably running out of time slightly, yeah, am I? I've got, I've got five minutes. Okay, good. So let me um, then, on the flip side of the idea of the migrant crisis, talk about what we might mean by a refugee crisis. And here, you know, there are a number of different sets of issues which we perhaps should be thinking about. One is that, according to research carried out by a whole raft of different perfectly kind of substantial and reliable <laughs> Um, academics, journalists and others, it is now demonstrably the case that we know that the large majority of people who arrived in the EU from 2015, let's say to date, but I mean certainly 2015, 2016, 2017, the years in which the numbers of arrivals were highest, um, the majority of those people eventually received either refugee status or some other form of humanitarian protection in an EU state. So in practice, if what we're talking about is, oh, well, broad strokes, let's call it how it is, those people were, in fact, refugees, which may you know, have been predictable, given that over 50% of the people who arrived during those years in the UK, certainly, and yeah, I think it's also the case um, in the, EU, the EU um, more broadly, where obviously the numbers are massively bigger, were from Syria and Afghanistan, mm -hmm. i.e. two obviously conflict-affected countries, with other large numbers of people coming from other places which also produce large numbers of refugees in the regions where those places are. So it was always likely, frankly, that the people who were coming were going to be recognised as refugees, and if they weren't going to be recognised as refugees, that was almost more an indication that some kind of political sleight of hand was taking place vis-à-vis -vis the way that the migration management kind of bureaucracy was being deployed in response to them. And we, of course, know that there were a number of different locations, geographical locations, but also kinds of spaces within which, despite their legitimate asylum-seeking status, despite the likelihood that they were eventually going to receive refugee status, people were treated in ways which totally, totally contravened international norms and expectations and the legal refugee protection framework. So again, you've got this kind of functional ignorance coming in whereby the fact that there was a very compelling truth, demonstrably present, didn't have a positive consequence in terms of the way that people were responded to and the way that they were treated in line with the very well-known and very well-understood refugee protection framework. So I suppose there's a sense in which, you know, to kind of shorthand, my, my kind of conclusion to all of this is to say that if language can be so consequential when it's misused, 
in terms of the kinds of responses which are made to people, in this case in asylum seeking, you know, um, refugee status seeking contexts, then there must be some mileage for us in responding as activists, as academics, as researchers, as, write, uh, as writers, in reclaiming, reappropriating, and repopulating mm. with kind of truth, honesty, and empathy the terms which are being bandied about in ways which kind of reactivate them and re make them re-accessible in a sense to us. Because I think that to some extent people have felt rather kind of beaten down by the onslaught of kind of negative press and the onslaught of kind of negative representations and left feeling uncertain about their own responses in terms of the kind of the kinds of representations which have been made, which haven't been exclusively, but have to some extent been characterized by these kinds of tragic, poignant, painful human interest stories, which have been mobilized again and again as a way of encouraging a kind of a warmer, softer, better political response, but which actually don't speak to the hard realities of the need and of the rights of the people in them. I mean, I'm a bit nervous about human rights going out, to be honest. <laughs> Not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, it, it kind of sounds negative, but in the end, maybe there is at least a glimmer of positive hope in it, in that there is this kind of call for a kind of a re-engagement with that language mm. and a, a kind of a reclaiming of it. Mm -hmm. I think I'll leave it there. Okay. Hello? Yes. Okay, good. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for all coming. Um, I, uh, yeah, I don't work in development studies. Um, I sort of work slightly laterally to it, and um, I really love the opportunity to, to um, discuss these issues with um, all of you. I was, I was rereading uh, the book, uh, Andrea's book, uh, Andrea and Deborah's book, uh, last night, and it struck me there was an interesting tension between the first two chapters, and it actually kind of follows on from what Tanya was saying. And that tension is very much about whether language can be repurposed or resignified, or whether it should be abandoned, right? And in Andrea's opening chapter, towards the end, she makes the case for resignifying language. But in Gilbert's uh, um, chapter after that, he's making quite a strong case for why the terminology of development should be abandoned altogether. And I suppose I'm leaning, uh, at least in this talk, who knows in another talk, I'm leaning, uh, I'm leaning very much towards the latter, not because I think um, uh, we should abandon the, the motivations behind a lot of this stuff, but because there's uh, a character of development as a concept and as an idea which is so riven with structural problems that it might be better to abandon it. Um, but that's not actually what I'm going to focus on uh, in the first part of the talk. What I'm interested in is not so much the meanings or non-meanings of particular words, but what is the political effect of the churn, right? The churn is the replacing of one term with another, the in and out, the faddishness, um, and the continuous renewal, the kind of restless, impatient renewal all the time at all at all places, really, of the development structure of the development industry of what it is that is happening. And I'm interested in the churn as a political phenomenon in its own uh, right. What functions does it serve? And I also, I mean, I won't reflect on it now, but maybe we can talk afterwards about the relationship between the churn in a field like development and in fields such as our own, higher education, health, and so on, where so much of that restless initiativization and a kind of uh, cycling of ideas is starting to just characterize what it means to do the work. Okay, so materially, what's involved, if you like, in the life cycle of a buzzword? So often you might have something emerge as part of a crisis and then a reaction to that crisis. So we were not prepared for this earthquake or we were not prepared for HIV AIDS or we were not prepared, you know, so on. So there's a crisis, there's a reaction, then a concept starts to engage and to proliferate. Now with the proliferation of a concept, you get a proliferation of experts, people who know about the concept who need to be consulted. These people write reports, they engage in advocacy, they form networks, uh, they develop policies, those policies attract funding. That funding goes out into uh, programs and into projects. Uh, at the national and local and international level. There are evaluations of those programs and projects. There are reviews of the wider 
programs of the wider ideas and repeat, okay? So there's another crisis, another concept, another set of experts, another bunch of consultancies and so on. And so we see this pattern materially constitute the life cycle of buzzwords as they exist in the development uh, industry. Now, okay, you can see this as just, it's just an inefficiency, it's just cost of doing business, if you like, in a development field which is informed by research and is responding to new situations. I'm going to argue that you can also see it slightly differently, and I want to now think about what that experience is like if you are an aid-receiving country or an aid-receiving subject, and this is what I try to do in my, uh, in my book as well, uh, to think about the effects of that churn on being an aid-receiving country. My story is pretty negative, I suppose. Um, in my view, uh, large development infrastructures over time, and my case was uh, Mozambique that I looked at over the last kind of 20 years, is that you get a progressive hollowing out of the state infrastructure as attention and resources and people are sucked up into servicing the churn, right? So the churn itself becomes the object of political uh, practice, of policy making, of uh, all of the intellectual activity that goes on in the universities and outside it. Um, and what happens is that not only, of course, is there sort of embedded dependency, and this is a word used by people uh, within Mozambique, um, but a certain embedded cynicism. I don't mean by this like a bad attitude. I mean that rationally speaking, it makes no sense to invest time and attention into something that is going to disappear in two or three years, right? So there's a lot of satisficing, there's a lot of production of reports and reporting, but in terms of concretely working on things in an institution or in a department or in a sector, um, it's difficult to invest real time and money into that because of the effect and the weight of that churn cycle. That means that you can't consolidate or grow or invest in a particular idea. If you're working in health, you can't uh, be guaranteed that uh, money for family planning is going to be there in the next cycle and you might be working on HIV AIDS instead, actually it's happened the other way around. Uh, all of the money for unsexy things that are not part of the buzzword framework or not in fashion uh, gets kind of by the wayside or reappropriated through those other big vertical pots that are coming down. Um, I could go on about this, but the generalized effect, I would say, with, and this is not a comment on the will and the good faith of the people involved on either side, but the generalized effect is a hollowing out of political activity. Why does this happen? Um, I asked a few people in Mozambique that I was talking to as part of this project, uh, why they thought that there were always new programs and new initiatives and new ideas to do when the other ones either hadn't quite finished or been realized to fruition. Uh, one of the answers that I talk about in the book is this idea of protagonismo, right? So the idea that donors in particular want to be at the center of a story, right? So they need ways to reinsert themselves into policy making on health or agriculture or good governance or whatever it is. And one of the ways in which this happens is the invention of a new concept or a new subfield in which they need to present expertise, generate an action plan, do something else, right? Um, and this is really significant for how it relocates agency control and power within the development uh, nexus. So buzzwords uh, function politically to empower the outsider. They empower the zeitgeist. Uh, they empower the new, right? They are current and therefore they are currency. And this fits into a wider uh, problem with development as essentially um, a concept about time, right? Development is about going forward. It's about being advanced. And to be advanced is to be up with the times. And therefore to develop is to adopt all of these new ideas, new phrases, and to keep up in significant ways. Now, we might see this, then there's been a lot of writing about whether this is to do with the development industry itself or whether we can see this as a feature of modernity in general. Um, I think that's a useful question to ask. Uh, I think we can overstate the difference between, let's say, modernity and coloniality. I'm a big fan of the works and analyses that bring those two uh, concepts together. But more than that, I think there's something interesting going on, which is about the recentering of the donor within development activity that leads to the continuous churn 
of buzzwords, right? It's about the realization of oneself as a progressive agent, as a savior, as a helper or an assister or as a technical uh, expert. Um, and this is not going on at any kind of deliberate or conspiratorial level, but it is just how subjectivities are constituted in this field and by our discourses. Now, alongside these experiences, or what I would say experiences of being the sort of person on the receiving end of this uh, constant innovation, um, we also need to remember the historical origins of development as a discourse. Uh, and this is also actually pulled out of uh, Gilbert Rees' chapter in the, in the book, which I'm encouraging you to read. Um, and that is a reminder that the concept of development as taken up and practiced by the West over the last kind of six or seven decades itself was a form of geopolitical counterinsurgency. That is to say that particularly after the end of the Second World War and at the time when a number of countries were demanding independence, demanding reparations, demanding all kinds of justice, the promise of development assistance was to uh, essentially reassure them that they would be looked after, that they would be encouraged and taught how to come up to the standards of the civilizing powers. Uh, and it would also form a bulwark against communism, as we know, right? Walt Rostow's work, an anti-communist or non-communist manifesto. So in this context, the ideas of development were conceived and practiced as a way of essentially giving the third world enough or thinking about giving the third world enough such that it wouldn't take another path and other experiments either failed or were actively undermined by that uh, process. So development itself, I'm not saying that origins always constitute the future of a concept by the way, I think that's a mistake that a lot of colonial or post-colonial analysis can make quite clearly. Just because something had colonial origins doesn't mean it does in the present. However, I do think that the production of a development industry has created a number of vested interests in the continuation of that industry, both in a material sense in which we might think of kind of corporate interests, but also in a political sense of how we arrange our political consciousness and subjectivities. And what we can see through the churn of buzzwords is a constant re-harnessing and reconstitution of the development project as it incorporates resistance and critique, right? It is not a coincidence that the things that it has incorporated as buzzwords have come from activists uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so on trying to engage critically with that project. And I think particularly when we look at things like gender or empowerment or participation, uh, these began life as quite stinging critiques of development practice uh, and have since been kind of reabsorbed. The last thing I'd like us to think about really is the relationship between the idea of development as a sort of practice of giving economic assistance or political assistance to countries in the global south and the category of development as a social scientific term of art, right? So we have this problem that the idea of development is very deeply embedded into political science, economics, uh, anthropology to a certain extent, uh, various forms of history, Marxism, vegetarianism. Like, if we think about social science as a set of knowledge practices, it's very difficult to think about what it would mean without the concept of development, without some idea of some people being in the future and some people being behind them, historically speaking, even if you have quite a critical perspective. I've tried to play around a little bit with concepts that I think are more useful. I think uh, terms such as accumulation, concentration, transformation help us to capture change without tying us into the kinds of teleology of development and therefore facilitating the slippage between, let's say, scholarly usages of the term development and their political uh, usages. So a challenge for all of us for scholarship is alternative ontologies and alternative categories of thought for talking about things like the accumulation of wealth, the, deve like the development of industrialization, the emergence of industrialization, and so on. Um, so just to conclude, buzzwords are amusing, they, they, you know, they have this kind of bullshit dimension and that's uh, worth engaging with and worth being self-reflexive about. However, we shouldn't forget about the political functions that buzzwords serve and the kinds of practices that they enable and that the churn itself enables rather than the words themselves. Mm. It is emblematic, I would say, of a kind of structural dynamic within uh, development as a concept and a practice. Uh, and enables very much what we might think of as, you know, what Makanda Wire called choiceless democracies in the global south, right? The sort of 
constant reinvention from the outside and an attempt to hold something together in the middle without any real kind of uh, popular or public engagement. All right, thanks. Great. Um, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so, um, yeah, questions, contributions, um, thoughts, all of that was lots of food for thoughts, very um, interesting insights. Um, yes. Person on the floor, just behind you, yeah. Yes, thank you very much for that discussion. I was uh, particularly um, moved to start thinking about Anna Arendt's discussion about human rights and the necessity for states to create that and also Agamben and this issue of the state of exception and it seems quite a deliberate choice the politicization of migration because what it actually does is to isolate the context that produces the refugees and the asylum seekers so I just wondered if you could relate back to sort of Agamben and Anna Arendt and make some connections there thank you Thank you. So we'll take um, a few and feel free to come in in the discussion. Yeah. Uh, yes, at the back there. Thank you. So um, in the context of the um, uh, refugee versus migrant use, um, so there's a uh, like a sort of pressure group called um, Stop Funding Hate and they sort of pressure different or um, like corporations basically to not um, fund uh, like the Daily Mail and those kind of like horrible um, papers. Uh, but I was wondering, uh, so that's kind of like a like non-legal way to do it, but is there any legal way to hold something like uh, the Daily Mail or even, for example, the BBC to account for the misuse of words? If uh, can you make a uh, yeah? Have you ever heard of using like legal instruments to hold them to account for yeah misuse of language? Thank you. Okay. Yes. At the back, and then and then you yeah. Thank you for that. Um, just a two-part question. Wondering if you think land reform is a, considered a buzzword at all? And also land reform, OK. Yeah. And also, um, where uh, land reform is on like donors' list of priorities within development, so it seems like if that was gotten right, then it would be a good way to break away from dependency. Thanks. And then over here. If you could just um, just make a bit of room so the so the volunteers could come up and get the mic, thanks. I've got one, thanks. <laughs> um, so I'm um, currently doing um, some research, uh, doing discourse analysis of intersectionality um, in GVV discourse in humanitarian spaces. So thank you for making this event for me, basically. Um, <laughs> That's what it's very for. Very helpful, thank you. Um, so I was particularly uh, struck by the fact that intersectionality came up in the new list of buzzwords um, and that, um, Professor Cornwall, you characterize it in particular as one that is used in a particularly vacuous way. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that mm -hmm. um, and also about the risks of, um, you know, the, the very concrete risks of taking these um, terms that come from a political, um, you know, from political projects and movements and their co-option in development discourse. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, and over there. Um, over there to, to your right. Hi, yeah, I was wondering if you could just elaborate on the connection between funding and buzzwords and how we as practitioners could kind of subvert this top-down approach to ensure that we're doing the work that is needed um, rather than kind of following the current modes of thinking from the top. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, my question is for Mira specifically. 
And thinking about the reclaiming or the, the task that you throw at re-signifying re those words, thinking about social movements in the political context, and how sometimes through the buy-in, so these concepts are defined outside by social movements in their contested nature, sometimes buy into this, is there real room for social movements to reinvent, to reclaim these words? Uh, thinking as well that some of the words that come from the, um, within the, in the contestatory nature, I'm talking about particularly leftist movements, are not necessarily defined in the, in the, in the periphery, if you talk about it. So what kind of periphery are you talking about? Is it just a mainstream periphery, or is it also within social movements? Are we, there's also some marginalization in terms of who defines what? Great, thanks. Oh, very, uh, excellent questions. Yeah. Hi. Um, as a de I'm a development practitioner, so I don't feel very good about my job right now and the words <laughs> that I use every day. But I guess the question is, this is incredibly interesting and, and it's something that should be thought about in the way in which we work, but what are the ways in which we can make sure that we are not appropriating language but questioning it and giving agency to the people who are affected by that language. So it's to what extent, what are some practical things that we could do to sort of cha change the rhythm of the churn in a way? Thanks. Okay, um, let's um, hold that thought. Uh, let's get our, our panelists to just um, come in for a few minutes. There's quite a lot of questions and then, and then we'll resume again. Yeah. Um, do you want to stop or do you want to go in reverse order? Or? Okay, thank you. I'm just, I think, going to respond to the questions about the migration and refugee thing, just for obvious reasons. Um, I think it's, it's very useful to think in terms of a Gambon state of exception and, you know, kind of similar literature. I, I think one can push it almost immediately further than thinking about the difference between refugees or, mig or migrants or different categories of forced migrants, the legal political classifications which are being used, albeit that there are resonances there as well. But I think if you think further to work, for example, by Bauman on you know, surplus populations and the detritus of kind of um, globalization, you, you really start seeing a world which is being divided into categories of people who are regarded as useful to you know, what we understand to be the kind of capitalist globalized system or whatever. Um, or are not useful. And, and to what purpose can populations be put? And I think, you know, Again, if you think about the way that Bourdieu writes about the, the way that language can be symbolic, can also be violent, can be connected in a sense to structural violence, you see exactly the ways in which how you talk about these kinds of people and the situations that they find themselves in, you know, precisely kind of contributes to the construction and reconstruction of precisely those kind of oppositional relationships. So I think it's a really valuable kind of, you know, way of thinking about it. Um, as far as the um, thinking about a legal recourse for, you know, disgusting right-wing kind of publications and other um, sorts of mouthpiece, I mean, I'm not aware of any kind of legal response which is possible in the context of, you know, a kind of a, um, a legal discussion or discourse. I mean, none of the things that I've described, albeit that many of them, you know, point towards actions which are highly questionable and possibly eventually themselves illegal under at least international refugee and humanitarian law, um, if not more um, locally, are not, you know, the language which is used is not in itself insightful or, is that even a word? But you know what I mean? It doesn't kind of do the kinds of things which for which a legal recourse could be made. So obviously there is freedom of speech, there, you know, people are free to express views however um, horrible they are. I mean, I think that it, nevertheless there is some kind of, even if more limited response to be made in terms of calling that kind of language and you know, spelling out, articulating, making explicit what it is actually saying and then inviting people you know, to participate in a discussion about whether that's actually what they think and whether it's actually what they mean. I mean there is a, a very, very important part of the public discourse which is organized around wrong information, as I've already tried to say. I was talking earlier in the day with some of our students about um, some of the public information surveys about asylum and immigration which are carried out by Europol 
Um, it's very, very shocking to what extent there are misunderstandings about, on the basis of which people make decisions about what they think about Simon and integration, for example. Um, and then if you look at specific studies that are being carried out, the one that I mentioned that UNHCR commissioned at Cardiff, for example, looks at um, media discourse and coverage relating to refugees and asylum issues in five European countries, including the UK, and it specifies the UK as having the most vitriolic right-wing kind of coverage in terms of the kind of language which is used and kind of the sorts of political positions which are espoused. You know, more than countries which we might find ourselves surprised to be worse than in these stakes. Um, the Italian media, media, which is well known for being really kind of brutal in its coverage of asylum and immigration, comes out in this study as less kind of violently opposed and less <laughs> problematically representing. So, we have to keep looking. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll maybe pick up the questions about the risks of um, taking terms that come from um, sort of more radical political projects and being co-opted into development discourse, um, how to subvert top-down approach and re-signifying the words from social movements, how social movements can, can uh, is there room for them to reinvent these words? And I think something that really, was a really interesting insight for me when I looked in, started looking into this was the value of these words as fuzz words. So I saw fuzz words as words that had very, very vague and expansive meanings that would shelter a multiplicity of possible agendas and therefore would be Trojan horses that could be used um, to be able to enter into certain kinds of political spaces or steal into conversations or into um, opportunities um, to be the recipient of funding um, for, um, you know, by donors wanting one thing um, and then actually getting something very different because you're using the same language. So I was interested in the subversive uses of fuzz words um, and then the strategic deployment of fuzz words in order to be able to seek that kind of funding support. Um, I have a, a colleague who would routinely put um, funding calls and things through something called Wordle and find out what the main words, how the words, what Wordle does, if you know it, you put a, a tranche of text into it and the words that are repeated most often come out to be larger. So this person would then put them in their funding bid and then run the wordle on the funding bid and see if there was a match and then submit the funding bid and get the money. <laughs> so as a tactical maneuver, the, the strategic use then of these or tactical use of these fuzz words can be a, a way of reclaiming them. Um, I had a moment with Diffid. Diffid gave um, myself and a sort of motley collection of feminist activists spread around the world um, a rather large amount of money to work on women's empowerment, which we highly disapproved of as a concept because it had become, it started to become so voided of meaning. We included in our project people who'd advanced it as a feminist, um, uh, you know, feminist word, and we wanted to reclaim some of those meanings, but some people were quite sceptical at that point. And halfway through the project, um, they turned around to me and said, but this stuff that you're doing here on sexuality and pleasure, it's not really empowerment, is it? And I was like, oh, yes, it is. <laughs> it's all about empowerment. <laughs> so you can use it to harbour many things. Um, I think also, let's remind ourselves also, you know, of the ways in which discourse can be used in various ways by those who have less power. So Foucault writes about the strategic reversibility of discourse, about the fact that it's never set it's always a, an act of manoeuvre to be able to find ways of placing yourself within discourse and putting yourselves in a position where you can turn it to your advantage for resistance. So I, I like the idea of that as well. Um, and sometimes putting a bit of bullshit in can also make you feel empowered even in a very small way. Um, in terms of um, strategies, um, I thought about this quite a lot and talked about it quite a lot as we were doing this because rather than a sort of bleak deconstruction of everything, we wanted to come up with something to say, well, actually, this is not about saying we're never going to use this word again. The word is being used. It's being used out there. It's access to certain kinds of spaces, certain kinds of resources. So, and we want to actively, even if we're not actively re-signifying it, through our practices and through our uses of it, we can begin to steal in and claim and reclaim and remold the ways in which this word is being used. So some of the things that occurred to us were to use, the philosopher Wittgenstein has a concept of family resemblances, which you probably are familiar with, so things that are common and similar. So how do you build in a sentence or a paragraph or a document enough family resemblances 
that signify those words with the meanings that you want to fill them with. So Ernesto Laclau has got this idea of chains of equivalence. So what is it about putting words together with other words that slough away certain meanings? So if you put the word rights along with customer, um, market, and so on, you have a very different chain of equivalence than if you put rights together with human, citizenship, and so on. Um, the other thing is using adjectives. So, um, or mimicking some of the phrases. So I became fond at certain points, and I should probably take this up again, of arguing for a pleasure-based approach to development, because there was a rights-based approach, there was a results-based approach, there was a community-based approach, and it was, why not have a pleasure-based approach, and then start a conversation about how it would look different uh, if you did that. Um, so some of the hyphenation practices that are used to give a different meaning. So anyway, that's playing with words, but I, I, as somebody who's interested in the political uses of words, I think we can play with words. We can, that's why I started with Goethe, who was a great, you know, made up and used words in very creative ways. Because it is also a way about, you know, we're not only reclaiming the use of those words, we're reclaiming some of those acts and some of those spaces um, that otherwise would just be empty. So if we refuse to participate because we're not interested in a debate about that particular word or that particular concept, we take ourselves out of that space. We lose a voice in that space. And I think, so my final point really is about social movements carrying on going into and contesting within those spaces, even if the means of invitation into those spaces are highly restrained uh, and restricted to words that they might otherwise not feel any sense of kindred with. Once they enter into those spaces and begin to debate and bring other ideas and repopulate those spaces with different kinds of ways of framing those words, they can gain a sort of political mobility that they didn't have before, or regain them. Having said that, uh, I wrote that as a conclusion to a paper for New Left Review. They liked the paper, they hated the conclusion. Yeah. <laughs> and they rejected the paper. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe it's no good. <laughs> um, thanks. I'll, um, just on the land reform question, I, I don't... Any word could be a buzzword, I think, uh, given the sort of analysis we're engaged in. I don't know where it is on donors' list of priorities, and that's because I haven't checked for like 10 minutes, so it might have changed. <laughs> um, but um, uh, at one point, it actually, no, I mean, there's a more serious story here, which is that uh, in Mozambique, land reform has been a big battle, a political battle for a long time, because uh, Mozambique's independence was founded on the basis that land should be publicly owned. And so the World Bank and so on have been pushing the Mozambican government to privatise it for a long time. They've always resisted and they found workarounds and things to do. Um, and there's also been a long struggle by community organisations to get land titles registered, which has been achieved with assistance and cooperation from another, a number of other donors as well. Um, that's only partial and as the battle over agribusiness changes. But... Um, all of that is just to say that um, there is political potentiality and there is important political work being done under all of these umbrellas for buzzwords. And I, even though I'm making a kind of structuralist critique about what these things entail, I don't, I don't um, begrudge anybody an opportunist, uh, an opportunist moment to get something done in a particular way through funding uh, streams. That's important. Like, people's lives depend on that, and that's you know, not something um, I complain about. With regards to how to avoid uh, or how social movements can kind of engage productively in uh, what is going on, I think the key, I think one of the key things is actually for social movements not just to articulate principles such as justice or equality, uh, but to articulate demands, right? And I think when you have got a demand that is your clear demand that says something very specific, it becomes much more difficult to co-opt or to push away or to uh, kind of dissolve in some kind of strategy paper, right? So saying that you want equality and justice is, is, is good, right? But saying we want a universal basic income of £10,000 for every person in the country, like that's something which is very concrete, which actually might be more productive than campaigning for some kinds of benefit reform on this and this and the other thing, right? It's a clear thing. It's a positive thing. You can create real weight behind a particular demand. So the job of the movement will be to philosophize and deliberate and to think about what the priorities should be. But I think when movements publicly campaign, and they do need to publicly campaign, it needs to be about concrete things like, you know, three acres of land for everybody, universal basic income, or, you know, um, government support for price for X, 
Um, and I think those kinds of organized concrete wins can really help and avoid the discussion about how deep to go into the weeds with various partners. Because then you can choose your partners also, depending on who is actually going to help you realize this demand rather than are we going to have a long time partnership of this and that character, because you can't make those strategic decisions, um, I think, at the level of the movement. Um, for the practitioners, how can you change the rhythm of the churn? It's a really interesting question. I actually think there are both simple things that would make a big difference and bigger things. So this whole thing about, like, protagonismo and so on, like, having simple things like agricultural projects which last for 10 years rather than three years... Uh, don't require consistent reporting, but have a clear level of like funded support that is not being eaten up by reports and consultants and so on. Like just making more space, even within whatever whatever the size of the thing that you hold, just making more space for people to define their own terms and what they want to do. I just think is uh, crucial, um, and I think it's that. Um, holding of the ring or holding back the, the other kinds of forces that uh, people can do solidaristically uh, in a way which might help development practice realise things. Okay, it's getting interesting. Um, we had a question over there. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, I have the feeling that we have to explain and justify every single word that we use in our research. And... Um, in my case, I'm looking at the role of English in processes of modernization and development. Just a, bit cl a bit closer to your mouth, yeah. Here? Okay. So, um, in my case, I'm looking at the role of English in the, ro in the processes of modernization and development. So, of course, I need to explain what develop development is, uh, modernization. But I'm in a point in which I'm reading about that thing called English. <laughs> You know, so um, I have the feeling that it's endless. <laughs> when to stop? Okay, thanks. Um, and over here. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think one of the biggest, for me, buzzwords and fuzzwords to be revisited, challenged, and even maybe abandoned is development itself. Yeah. Because when we talk about development, what those decision makers or those people in power mean, they mean capitalist development that maintains the neo-colonial and imperial structures of powers. And in that respect, I want to engage with you, Mira, in what, in what you said. Um, like you, I'm inclined to be on the opinion of Rist and others like Arturo Escobar in his book, Encountering Development, that we need to discard that whole discourse. Um, because it is based on, you know, a dominant imaginary that wants, that tends to say it is universal and imposes itself on others, and that discourse is, you know, the modernity, the modernity thing. And you touch and say in modernity and coloniality. I would like you to, to elaborate more on that. Thanks. And over there. What? Um, really enjoyed the uh, panel, I thought it was fantastic. Um, and uh, I just had a, one comment and a, and a question. It, the, f the comment comes back to the functions of the buzzwords again. And to me it seems as if there's a tension between um, what, uh, what Andrea sketched out as being what would be the classic Marxist analysis of, of or implication of it, of being that the buzzword is used as a kind of cloaking device to, hu to hide and conceal, to distort different material and political interests. So we have that class, we have that, that tradition. But also, you know, just speaking to what Mira was saying, is again that, that there are all kind of very kind of non-cynical functions of the language in terms of status, recognition, just basic communication. Mm -hmm. So to me it's like the part of the tension is that you as an academic come along and say, oh it's it's concealing, you know, it's all terrible, you know, you, you don't know your real interests, etc. But, but well, you may, you may not say that in that, those terms, but, but, um, but the, the fact is that some other defender of the vocabulary can say, no, we're just, we're just you know, together, it's just a, a part of a communication process. So, so to me, that's a tension between the, the different effects and functions of it. 
Um, the question is more of a kind of, uh, is one about the kind of, um, whether you can map out a kind of um, hierarchy of buzzwords. I mean, clearly we're talking about development as a kind of linchpin, but is it possible to think about other master uh, buzzwords and maybe secondary buzzwords which are swirling around, spinning off it, and maybe there's another tier which are the real, uh, you know, just just uh, em empty ones that just come and go, may not may not last very long, and so forth. Is it possible to do a kind of categorization of the buzzwords? Thanks. Yeah. Anything bouncing off um, what this gentleman has just said? Um, I'm interested if you could speak to how buzzwords can create barriers of entry, um, not only for people affected by the development process, but also for practitioners um, and how they, they might promote specialist and siloed approaches to development, um, limiting multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary um, approaches to complex problems. Okay, thanks. And over here. Yeah. Um, I, I had wondered about uh, some of your views on um, the, the links between buzzwords used in development um, and broader buzzwords um, used in society and, and, um, and how, how much um, this field is a reflection of, of broader trends that are out there. And then I had um, a, a, also a specific question about views on um, the role of um, global frameworks and global goals in terms of consolidating um, uh, understanding and, and focus on, on certain areas, so, so things like the MDGs and SDGs um, and uh, yeah, views across the panel from those. Great, thanks. Yep, and one over there. Um, I have also two things. One is just a small comment. You mentioned earlier that uh, innovation is coming in as one of the new buzzwords. I was a bit surprised because uh, it seems to have been around at least since Pharma first, so maybe it's having a second, third, or however many is spring, but <laughs> yeah, I guess they come and go. Um, and then my question regards to some things that you already somehow touched on, that I have the feeling that um, in the way that development functions, even if you question the term itself, the short-lived nature of projects seem to not make it possible to get around the use of uh, buzzwords, because if you don't use what's sexy and up-to-date, you might not get the funding to do what you want. Um, and I quite like the idea, I think, that Andrea brought up about um, kind of subversively getting in there. I am wondering how, how well that works in practice in terms of accountability towards the donors. Um, will you be able to do this more than once? Um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, and um, how much influence really does development practice have on the length of project cycles? Because like, to me that seems so inherently problematic. If you always have three-year projects, you can't really get around that. So how you said maybe 10-year projects would make more sense. How? How feasible is that really? Yeah. All great questions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it seems that the, uh, the umbrella of buzzwords is you know, expanding and expanding. And uh, I presume this question has been asked in different forms here, but I'm just trying to highlight it again, that uh, uh, the development buzzwords have gained such a traction, I would say, that they've almost subsumed more culturally relevant ideas of, say, social service, and, you know, would you think there is still a distinction between them as how social service can be seen or how, uh, or are they completely repackaged now? And if that is the case, then what does it essentially mean for societies where these ideas are fundamentally very relevant still today? Um, I think maybe this has been, uh, it's a bit related to the question of land reform, I think, in a sense, but um, good governance and um, I think the relative lack of um, inequality in, in some of these um, discourses and, and um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Um, from an IT background, one of the things that changed 
uh, information technology completely was the integration of different chips into one code. And that did not only reduce the size of the computing gadget, but changed a lot of things. And I'm looking at a time when there are efforts being put into bringing different disciplines and departments and so on into what is ideally to form one thing, interdisciplinarity and so on. And then a word that in the 1970s didn't mean much, like resilient, is now appearing in the buzz of first word. And it comes with a lot of advantage as well. And in the field, at the end of last year, I came across uh, an approach that was taking a human rights based approach and on one side and one that was taking a more capitalist um, approach on one side and they both connect in one word which was resilience approach and which is a new word but is buzzword a problem? Can we see it as an advantage because it's being driven by not just the fanciness of the word, but also by other things happening, especially within the academic as well. Thank you. Resilience, that's got to be a new one, yeah. for sure. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. I, I was just thinking that's just an incredible idea because it goes back to what you were saying about the teleological chilo approach, like always looking for the next best thing, next best thing. And behind that, the history of development is about, you know, on, in the 80s it was corruption and economic uh, liberalization of market forces and just one idea after the other, which is just a mass for a great range of activities with absolutely no end at all. So it's a production that keeps on producing its own meaning in that process. Um, but it just also reminds me of a very practical example doing technical assistance programs and you're in a situation where, you, as the expert, you're in a workshop trying to pass on knowledge and it, I, it just it always bothers me this idea of agency because it's never ever localized like this, this it's never clear what the local input is which will help you know the benef beneficiaries resolve their own problems so it's almost like the, it's almost like a black box even when we talk about agency and what we're trying to do with technical assistance programs we don't have a clear idea of how to enable, whether we give them information, whether we, we, we give them what it is that will help the beneficiaries resolve their own issues. And it, I, it just seems really just a very strange uh, process that we don't, there's a black box at the heart of what we're trying to do there. Sorry. Okay, yeah. Um, this one's back to the pr proliferation of expertise that you mentioned earlier. Um, and I feel like one of the things we've come up with to sort of avoid that development churn were country ownership and development effectiveness, which are now just buzzwords and sometimes empty. So is there a way to, are there any solutions to that? Or is there anything development practitioners who don't want to contribute to the churn, but this is also where they make their money and their funding um, is it sort of a circular problem or is there a way to break that cycle? We've got time for two, three questions more. Yeah. Um, um, so far, a lot of people have talked about agency, and I was wondering if you could. Uh, think of agency itself as a buzzword. Um, I think, I mean, I know Andrea talks about um, your work, kind of, in, you look at uh, appraisals of PRA. Um, so I'm wondering if that could be considered a buzzword in of itself. And giving, um, you know, giving agency, is that, is that problematic or, yeah? Giving agency, is that problematic? Oh, okay, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, um, so the guy before me was talking about um, Kind of, I mean, I think it's linked link to the idea of empowerment, maybe, um, empowering communities. But in that sense, you're kind of, um, uh, kind of putting the responsibility in communities to create the change themselves, and that can't, that kind of dissuades material, 
um, aid. So, yeah, so I guess that. Okay. Other questions? Don't be shy. Um, I was listening to a podcast a couple weeks ago that discussed um, the, I, I don't want to call it a phenomenon, because that's a buzzword, but something called like dog whistling, which is, um, I guess, using terms that um, have a loaded meaning. So it kind of allows the person using that term to imply a meaning, but innocuously kind of like hide behind um, the, the vagueness of the term. So the person gave the example, like using urban youth as opposed to speaking about specific racial minorities in cities. Um, and I was just wondering, because I've seen this so much in media, in um, even just discussions I have with friends and family, um, so I was wondering if you can maybe give some suggestions on how to call out these buzzwords when they don't have such innocuous meanings. Um, yeah, maybe in a way that doesn't put the user off, but kind of facilitates a discussion. Thanks again for the great discussion. Uh, it reminded me of this uh, discussion I had with this uh, researcher in the institute in the Netherlands. I'm researching uh, Dutch aid in the context of Mozambique as well. And I was talking with him on Dutch aid. Uh, he did this major project. Um, he's a historicist. He did a major project on um, Dutch aid in the since the history of uh, since development proper started in 1949, I guess. So he went into archives and all the rest of it. And we talked about buzzwords, which are actually popping up throughout this, uh, this history of Dutch aid. Not really new, like he talked about participation, which was a major buzzword in the 1970s. Um, he wrote this paper about it, but the conclusion was, you know, we're not really moving forward, you know, moving in cycles, which, and I thought about that, and I thought like, okay, what does participation mean in like in the 1970s, as opposed to participation in, in current times, you know, like in the start of neoliberal times, as opposed to advanced neoliberalism now, uh, just a thought, you know, it's, and it also reminded me of this paper that I think David Moss of SOAS as well uh, wrote, he wrote about like the addition of, of buzzwords. So the one buzzword is not really um, um, traded for another as it is sort of added up since the 1980s. Structural adjustment plus participation plus uh, good governance plus, you know, and that, that's been, uh, if you read about development or uh, development NGOs, they're talking about multiple of these buzzwords uh, in addition, not really pulling the, uh, the one out as, well, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So we'll hear from um, Mira and then Tanya, and then um, we'll give Andrew the last word, just three or four minutes uh, each. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm almost certain I'm not going to be able to do justice to all of these great questions. Um, I will, I'll maybe just say a general comment which might cover a few of the things. So the question about whether we have the term development, um, the question about local ownership, the question about like how to bring knowledges together, question about buzzwords. I mean, so what I would, I've tried to push back and think at a very basic level, what is the thing that development practice is trying to do, right? And I suppose it is trying to get to a world in which people have enough to eat, can do work, are not horribly oppressed in some way or the other. I mean, these are like, these are fundamental things that humans have tried to do through time. These are things that humans, I would suggest, without becoming a biological essentialist, humans do, right? If you put a bunch of humans in a space, give them a problem to solve, they will find a way to solve it and then they will find ways to, you know, be social and be political and so on. Um, what development discourse and practice has done is to try to scientize that process and put it into a language and a framework in which the capacities to do those things 
is delivered externally by people who know better and who look different from you, right? And so this is why the local ownership problem is actually it's at the heart of the very conundrum, right? Real local ownership means buggering off. I mean, no, I'm serious, right? And then once you say, okay, but is there any help that a rich person could give a poor person? You can do a bunch of things. Very simply, they come down to make the rules easier for poor people to get ahead and or give them some money, right? <laughs> and, and, you know, maybe access to knowledge and information, right? So if we're interested in helping global inequality, the best thing that people located in the West can do is lobby actively for fairer global economic rules, taxation, all of that uh, kind of thing, um, and make space, right? D trying to exit from the picture is quite difficult, but it's something around which both a number of conservative and radical positions are coming to converge around the idea of a kind of ethical retreat from trying to organize things. Um, because even though in principle it might be possible for there to be loads of international technical assistance and expertise and a thriving local democracy and a functioning political system and the building of institutions, in practice, the absorption of energies into the one precludes the other, I would say. So um, I think we just need to start thinking about development as human problem solving for well-being and you know, planet and so on. I mean, that's a very kind of woolly way of putting it. But when we think about it that simply, then we can abandon, I think, without too much heartache, the language that societies develop in this way. You must do this to develop. All of which is deeply contestable and context-based. Right? So um, what we're really talking about, I would say, is democracy. Right? Our people, and my understanding of democracy is that our people empowered to solve their own problems in ways that they collectively deliberate and choose upon. That's very complicated in a globalized international system. There's a whole Brexit debate going on right now, which is in some senses about this very same uh, problem. Um, but the democracy problem, I would say, in some sense, subsumes the development problem that they've been kind of uh, attacking each other for too long. I just will, I'll say a couple more things, because I know I've talked maybe too much about that. But um, Matt's tension between Marx and Foucault, really, about, you know, the sort of uh, nature of language, I think is... The tension between the, the, or, the ordinary functions of language, communication, mm. status, and the, the, the Marxist thing, the, the critique... The cloaking, yeah. Cloaking. Yeah, no, I think that's important. Um, language does... I don't, language both cloaks and produces, right? To produce is to to cloak, to articulate oneself in one way is to not articulate oneself in a, in a bunch of other ways. Um, and I think that's why democracy and accountability are important, because you have the opportunity to object to ways in which things are configured if there are the structures and the power enabled to, able to do that. I will say, if anybody's interested, read Matt's book on neoliberalism, because he's done a great kind of anatomization of the key concepts in neoliberalism, um, which I think is very cognate to this uh, stuff. Um, the last thing I will say is how to break the cycle. I don't know. Just like I, I do think it's about, to some extent, withdrawal. The question came. Where did the question come from? Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, I think it is about um, yeah, just actually with, withdrawing in some respects. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Mine's going to be very quick, and it refers to some of those issues um, in a slightly different way, which is that if we're talking about language, we're talking about people who are speaking. You know, we're talking about speech acts. We're talking about the contexts in which those speech acts take place. We're talking about a very wide range of voices, potentially, and it's inevitable, perhaps, in a conversation of this kind that the actors and the speakers will be kind of grouped, I suppose, into different kinds of categories. And we've talked very much about development and development practitioners as something which is kind of driven by, some in, for, for reasons which we understand, driven by 
external actors, our actors who are powerful, actors who are wealthy, actors who are in a position to, if not coerce, then impose views, kind of preferences, and so on. If we think about development and development processes as more kind of collaboratively processes of social transformation, which are kind of supported, which are potentially transformative for groups of people at a number of different levels. And we step back from the kind of the institutional, you know, kind of parameters maybe that we've been talking about. We might be able to think about ways of, I suppose, maybe doing a different pitch for buzzwords from a whole different constituency and asking what development looks like and what would be key words from those perspectives, which sounds a little bit naive at some level, but also, you know, in an integrative way might offer some scope for a different kind of conversation. I mean, we don't want to just be thinking in terms of a whole raft of different actors who are monolithically sealed inside their own subjectivities and personalities and can't talk to each other. So I guess that would be my kind of parting word. Okay. Great. So many questions that are so interesting. It's really hard um, to find a kind of a pithy answer, but I very much agree with what the previous two speakers have said. And I guess for me, in conclusion, um, I'm thinking, wouldn't it be fab to have the linguists in SOAS put together a module for development that would look at all of these things around the ordinary language, around performative language, about perlocutionary, illocutionary acts, the linguistic philosophers, and the people here have got serious expertise, political rhetoric, and use that as a way of decoding some of these languages and finding new political imaginaries from our existing practices. So I'm going to take that idea away and see if I can do something with it. I think it could be really, really interesting, maybe even as a summer course, just doing some of that, really teaching us about the ways in which language works. Um, and I think, you know, let's not get too simplistic about the ways in which the, our understandings of how we use language, the communicative acts um, that are part of the ways in which we make our worlds through language. We make the versions of the worlds by trading terms and by inhabiting them, by rejecting them, pulling away from them, and finding different ways in which we can repopulate our worlds and our social connections through language. So it would be interesting to do some sociolinguistic thinking around all of that. To the question of development, I was very struck when I first started reading about development. I didn't feel any association, positive, positive association at all with the term or the industry, and despite spending many, many years <laughs> engaging with it at its margins, with the idea of development as planned intervention. And those two words, I think, are really part of the problem, planned and intervention. Um, what, you know, who makes the plans? What are the plans about? How long are the plans for? What kind of, you know, so what's the engagement of people in those plans? And also what that idea of intervention is all about and what it amounts to. Um, so many of the comments you've made and comments from the panel, I think, are really useful for us to think with. Um, and if we reduce development to planned intervention, we can criticise the hell out of it. But actually, for many people, development is just about getting a better life, getting access to health care, having some of the things in life that we would all want, peace, you know, for your children to grow up, to have the ways of getting a job. Um, and I think when we strip it back to those things, as Mira has said, and we find a different place in it. And I had a very salutary experience of teaching going into um, the university from having worked in a policy institute, working with development on development, and teaching first-year students. And teaching this course that was aimed at decolonizing the ways in which they thought about themselves as potential development actors and decolonizing development. And we came to the last session of the course having stripped every single piece away from this development thing. And I said to them, just go out and, you know, in small groups and make up a project that can develop Sussex University. And they came up with all these really brilliant things. And there was so much good energy. And they wanted to transform the world. And so it is that reconnecting with that energy to transform, to make things better. At being mindful of the coloniality of attempts in the past um, and getting away from this idea of intervention that is done by people, distant others, um, which I think we need to... It's pulling us back to those things, which Mira said so much more eloquently. Um, on participation, a specific thing. So I look back earlier, the 1970s. So if you look back at the 1950s and the 1930s, it's very interesting. I wrote a paper on it. Um, and it's, um, I look back particularly at the um, writings of Lugard and Cameron, um, who were the architects of indirect rule. 
and found some, and they also put in place the panchayat system in India. Um, so that all came out of that, the ideas about participation from that period. Um, and in the 1950s, in the period of so-called you know, decolonization, again, handbooks were written on how to do participation. So it's all been, it's, it's been kind of thought before. Um, and so I, I asked Robert Chambers, guru of participation, who was a, a district officer in Kenya in the 1950s, very aware of this work, and had written about it in a very interesting, in the 1970s, a book of his, 1971 or 1973. But, sh you know, you've seen this stuff has come around. It's been before. You know, it's been before in the 70s. It's been born in the 50s. Why don't you say anything about it? And he said, oh, you know, I'm always hopeful that the next time this comes around, people are going to fill it with different meanings. And again, that's something positive to go away with, is that some of these words have might have been corrupted for our times and in our times. But the things that they signify that are things that we want to believe in, we can carry on filling them with. Um, and elsewhere, I've written about myths, development myths and fables, and how we tell ourselves stories, and you know, stories that have protagonists in them who do amazing things. Um, but also myths, part of the function of myths, and again from, ling from linguists, sociolinguists, part of the function of a myth is not to match reality in any way, but to tell you a story that makes sense of a world you'd like to, to have to be in, or that will take you somewhere in terms of your imaginary for the future. So I think, again, there's something to be said there about the stories we tell ourselves about struggles for injust against injustice and for e equality, or whatever we might like to think of as development, rather than telling ourselves a story that deconstructs and strips away the very possibility of us working on those things. And the very last thing is to think about one word, one development buzzword that you absolutely would not want to let go of, because that's also a quite an interesting exercise. So what word is, is so important that even if it's been really abused and misused, you really think, no, this is one that's worth having a fight over? Because that's also, I think, can be quite empowering. Um, join me in thanking all of our panellists.